Hello and welcome to the Metapod Pokemon TCG podcast that revolves around the evolving meta. I feel like, Sean, the, this is what, episode 62? I yes. feel like once every four episodes at this point, I actually say that catchphrase. And the other times, I'm just cracking jokes. <laughs> just anything other than that phrase. like. But I mean, that, that, that harkens back to our original uh episodes jake where you couldn't get the phrase quite right for the first oh my gosh yeah how how far we've come sean <laughs> now you don't even try you're like i know i got this i'm just gonna make yeah, jokes it's literally like the back of my hand but sean and i supporting our mugs this morning mm -hmm. sean how was your how was your labor day weekend it was good it was good i was in chicago which is also why anyone any astute viewers out there on the youtube version uh might notice that I wear hats when we record early in the morning yeah. because I haven't yet. My hair is an absolute mess. I mean, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll go. I'll show the viewers. It's just oh, the reveal hair reveal. Sean has hair. Oh, my yeah. God. It's just a mess. Man, if you're it's a watching mess, this on Spotify and iTunes, you're you're really missing out. <laughs> so that's how you can tell what time we're recording this. If it's not an early Tuesday morning, I'm not wearing a hat. Yeah, I, Sean will wear a hat and I will wear a sweatshirt and you won't see a shirt underneath it if you're <laughs> talented enough to be able to see that. I just roll out of bed, throw on a sweatshirt, pour the coffee, sit in this chair, and that is that. But we have a lot to to talk about on the podcast, not necessarily in terms of news, because actually, compared to last week, the news is pretty light this week. We are basing a lot of our stuff on uh some a little bit of theory sean sean mm -hmm. didn't sean left something out last week that, that he said after the pod that i was like sean i can't believe you left that out you're mentioning this this week so we got to talk about that and then also with the pog championships we got a couple things about that maybe a little bit of post rotation as well because that's happening in three ish days september 10th is when rotation happens on ptcgo so I am holding my breath trying to get there, Sean. I, I, it's, it's tough. I know. I keep hearing people being like, can we all just agree to play post rotation now, please? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of streamers that I watch regularly right now are doing mm -hmm. like post rotation viewer battles if they're not doing like a tournament of some sort. Mm -hmm. But um, thankfully, a lot of turn there's a good chunk of tournaments right now that are post rotation. So I think just the general consensus is like, It'll get here eventually, Sean. We just have to wait. I mean, that's how it was last year, too. I I'm remembering back, like, you had Pog and you had about a week of just, like, stop playing Control or stop playing whatever. Whatever was still pre-rotation, technically. Uh, and, you know, it's nothing can be done. Like, if they moved it back another week, there'd be a whole other week would we'd be annoyed. Complain earlier. Right. It's just, you know? it, it just time shifts the complaining. That's all that would happen. It's very interesting, and I will say, Sean, there were some very interesting Pog results that um, I want to get to later because uh, there was an archetype or two that I did not expect to do as well as it did. But, Sean, mm -hmm. you know what I did expect to do well? The wonderful five-star reviews that the pod listeners leave on the Metapod podcast. So if you like what you hear on the Metapod, make sure to please leave a five-star review. Do you want to read it this week or do you want me to? Um, I think I'll read it. I'll read it this week. Why not? Okay, Why not? You go for it. All right. This is from When It Blakes. Um, it, you know, funny name. Uh, although it looks like they also have a second uh, handle at the bottom that we'll read. But it says, knowledgeable and fun. Jake and Sean get deep into the current meta of the Pokemon TCG, and they really know their stuff. It's my favorite of the many TCG podcasts I listen to. Keep up the great work, guys. Uh, at Sore Thumb Collector. So, that is a great... I th I assume that's Twitter. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic name. Sore Thumb Collector. Um, also, your favorite of the many TCG podcasts. So that means you have comparatives, and we are the favorites. So... Uh, that's enough, more evidence, Jake, to the fact, <laughs> to the fact that we are, uh, the bestest. You know how, you know why that has become what it is, Sean? Why? Because I knew how to say our freaking catchphrase. That's, you're you know, right. As you... soon as I knew how to say that, our, our expertise and our level and credibility <laughs> just shot through the roof. I'm telling you. Um. I'm telling you, Sean. 
But thank you again so much, uh, when and Blake's or sore thumb collector for the wonderful, wonderful review. Again, leave, leave some reviews. If you're on YouTube, let us know down in the comments as well. I always see those and I always try to reply to as many comments as possible. So Sean, yes, let's get to what you wanted to leave out last week. Sean, we were talking about PTCG live. Mm -hmm. A rumored upcoming thing that is coming into the Pokemon trading card game. Many people discussing theories on like replacing Pokemon TCGO, just a reskin and that's it, a ranked ladder, all of these types of things. But Sean, after the podcast, you presented something that I have not heard mm -hmm. anybody talk about or anybody mention anywhere. And I think it's something that I wanted to bring up because I, it's like, a legitimate physical possibility. Sean, yep. what what was your what was your tinfoil hat theory? So this is something I'll just say I'll say my theory and then I'll say why it probably still isn't right. But we'll say the theory first because, you know, let's have fun here. Yes. Um, I'll go over here. There is a, a a trend in Japan. I say a trend. It's definitely Bandai. And I want to say I heard another company. I thought it was Pokemon in Japan, but. During the pandemic, there was this uh, trend of different card game companies building apps for you to play uh, with your physical cards over webcam. Now, obviously, you can just play with your physical cards over webcam on Discord, on Skype, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, and that's what we do for Digimon, right? But Bandai did build their own distinct app for this. Uh, now, granted, I don't use this app. I'm not in Japan. I don't use it on the regular. I don't know all the features. I don't speak Japanese, but uh, just to give you guys a sense, uh, especially for those of you on the um, uh, YouTubes, what it is, is I'll turn the volume all the way down here. Uh, it basically is just a phone app that acts as a webcam. And the benefit though, of something like this is I do think it is a lobby. So it says Bandai TCG online lobby, which suggests to me that it connects you to other players through webcam, which is a problem that Discord can't solve, right? Because Discord's an, a utility, like an all-purpose platform. So with Discord, you are just finding people and then saying, hey, meet me in table one or whatever. Uh, but this will do the lobby match, like the, the matching that happens on PTCGO, but with um, a physical card webcam layout on your phone. So. This was one where I thought, yeah, this could maybe be what uh, TCG Live is, to be frank. Um, let me see here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you think of the name Live, right? A lot of mm -hmm. people have been discussing different possibilities. But what is more live than your actual physical cards that you're shuffling and you're putting on the on the mat, you know? So like that's that was my tinfoil theory is like they they could relaunch it, allow people to get paired with other people that want to play over webcam, and maybe even have a system that like you know, if you are a TO right like the Sunday Open folks, you could actually do tournaments over webcam now because it would use the same platform as the online pairing system, but allow you to do it via like some some webcam tools. So the reason I don't think necessarily that this that tcg live is exclusively this at least is because they're still code cards code cards imply you redeem them for something of value if you're talking about physical cards there is nothing of value in a digital card if you want to play physical um, so i think that it will be more likely a rescan and nothing else but hey here's holding out hope that they they introduce um something like this potentially i don't think it's necessary but it's interesting you know, even if it's not this, do you even if PTCG Live is not this, do you want to know why I think that this is has like a a possibility of coming in, Sean? Something yes. like this, whether yeah. it's PTCG Live or something else. Tell me. We don't have any news on a next Players Cup or Team Challenge yet. You remember, Sean, like all throughout the summer, all throughout the spring. 
we like the the players cup the team challenge it was all overlapping you know like players cup three global finals going on players cup four you know ticketed events were going on you know they had all of this clash of these events these bigger online events that they've got but i mean we players cup four has been done for a couple weeks now Mm -hmm. right we don't we don't know anything about players cup five we haven't heard anything no rumors no tweets no no nothing so i'm just i don't know i i could see the the all of a sudden the stop they might be waiting for this new thing to come out right this new app to introduce or ptcg live and you know I don't I don't know. Every day that we don't get news about a new players cup or team challenge, I get closer and closer to thinking like, you know, this uh this might be this might be a thing. I mean, yeah, I it is surprising because like every other players cup or team challenge, it feels like before it even ended, they were starting the next one. They were um, at least talking about the schedule of the yeah. next one, you know? My gut goes back to the idea that they were expecting physical play to return on the sooner end of things. Oh, I'm sure. I'm um, sure. <laughs> and so they were they were planning around rotation, right? Like, oh, rotation's going to happen. That'll be a perfect time to start up. But obviously with the Delta variant, that's not happening. That's not happening. Um, and, you know, you look at places like Florida. Uh, it's just, it's so bad there that you, uh, you know, you're, you're back to like you know, pre-vaccine levels, uh, essentially. And so, yeah, I could see them you know, expecting that to happen, not not planning ahead for team challenges or players cups. And those things probably take some amount of preparation and time scheduling. So now that they are unsure when it's going to happen, like if they wanted to do it today, it would still maybe take them a month or two to actually get things on the book. So that's my that's my gut. And also, I don't know when TCG Live will launch that. Yeah, that's I, don't another... know. I don't know if anybody knows, really. Yeah, that's the only other, like, we know it will definitely need to launch by the time Fusion Strike comes out, right? Or mm-hmm. is it Fusion Arts, the name of the next set? I think it's, I think it's Fusion Arts, yeah. Yeah. But it's so, got the Fusion Strike cards. We know what you're talking about, Sean. Yeah. And so, like, the only thing that would come out between now and then where you could see maybe there being some news attached is, like, the 25th anniversary stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so that might be when they announce this new TCG Live is alongside 25th anniversary so if that's the case, then you might see something here in the next three weeks, I want to say. I think you'll, you'll probably find out in the next three weeks uh, about the app, is my guess. You know what else that you can find out about even sooner than that, Sean? The Atlas Pog Championship results. Now, we're not going to spend like an hour or anything on this because as we alluded to earlier, this is pre-rotation and post rotation happens next week but maybe maybe Sean you want to jump on to PTCGO you want to play a couple games you want to get yourself adjusted before rotation happens you know this is an excellent tournament to base off of and I just want to say right now I'm sorry that I beefed up Luke Metal didn't do as well as I thought it would it was popular one of the more popular decks Sean well but it, you're also looking at day 2 right yeah, that is Let's, that is true. So pod one, day one. I tweeted this on the Metapod. I felt so good about myself. Day one, pod one, the very first pod actually had really, really good results for Luke Metal Z. I believe it was the top percentage deck. Yeah. Win of, percent. It was fifty-nine percent win percentage. Huge. Yeah, which is which is not number one because I think there was another if we're talking about decks that had like fifteen or more people, I think it was number two. Mm-hmm. Um but, but very 59% is a very good percentage for decks. Usually usually see decks that have like more than 10 or 15 people have like under 60%, I would say for the most part. Mm-hmm. So I, I was right there, but then day two came around, Sean and day two. Do you want to talk about the most surprising part of day two? Uh, if I think you're going to think is the if, if I no, think yeah, that I, your the, surprising the thing is the same as my surprising thing. I think in, in terms of deck, it. it's clearly it's clearly Leafeon and Teleon, right? I would 100 percent agree. Leafeon and Teleon took by storm day two, making up uh, 
Oh, geez. I forgot the statistic. Making up eight of its players inside the top 32 to win money, including a third place finish by Viking Cock. Hopefully I said that correctly. 12th by Shintaro Ito. 14th by Celios Network, Luke River, Morza, and more. So just absolutely. I mean, people didn't, mm -hmm. people were like, okay, Leafeon is okay. Like it's not the worst evolution vmax but i don't think anybody like thought that it was going to do well as it did i mean in terms of win rate it had a 56 percent win rate on day two yeah which is pretty good and honestly it had 19 decks as well which was the tied for the third most played so sean if you want to let people know because i don't think we've really talked about leafy on a lot on this podcast what is leafy on vmax and the deck uh, Le'Veon VMAX is essentially a better Tangrowth, if any of you remember Tangrowth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, Grass Knot 60 times, six, this attack does 60 damage for each, you know, star or, or retreat cost in your active opponent opponent's retreat cost. So, um, the vast majority of, uh, VMAXs that are out right now have two, right? Two retreat is, is standard. Three retreat cost is like, you know, you're, you're doing great. One retreat cost, you're playing Dragapult against Dragapult VMAX or maybe Togekiss, right? Yeah, um, Togekiss has free retreat. Yes, which is <laughs> which would not be good for this deck's matchup. But <laughs> um, yeah, so it's basically a 60 times. You also have Max Leap for 170 and Heal 30, which, you know, maybe uh, situationally is not bad. If you're getting damage counters maybe pinged onto you, you can heal that damage off, uh, do enough damage to probably two-hit knock out anything. So... It's good. It's, it's it's a solid second secondary attack, but really the first attack is where your money is for two energy. I will I will admit that I did not expect Leafeon to do well. Like I I'm not gonna sit here and be like I knew it. I knew Leafeon was the greatest. But the more that I thought about it, and the more that I watched Celios Network play Leafeon Vmax and talk about it, the more it made sense how good Leafeon is against tag teams mm -hmm. sean i mean tag teams were still running around in this meta we saw a lot of dark mewtwo decks we saw a lot of luke metal decks again with the mewtwo mew other variants you know whether that's like welder mew or whatever and like adp mm -hmm. as well you know people still played adp decks not a ton but people still played some adp decks but with tag teams you know tag teams in my opinion, I believe they have an average higher retreat cost than VMAXs do. I think VMAXs usually tend to stick to two, while, like you said, while tag teams stick to three. And yeah. so with something like Absol, as you're seeing in the deck list that Sean is showing from the event, you know, you've got the Absol, you've got the Galar Mine, you've got the Echoing Horn for a lot of those Mewtwo dark decks, which is super, super good in my opinion. You know, you can get that Sableye Titar onto yeah. the bench again and again and again and again. I mean, this deck looks like a ton of fun, and especially if you can get a Leafeon down turn one and you can use that ability on the Leafeon V to accelerate an energy at the end of your turn. Yep. Like, th it's pretty efficient. It's a pretty... It's a pretty good run of a deck in my opinion watching yeah. it play for 15 plus rounds of best of three and I the think way it was best of three on day two right um i believe so but yeah and the way that it works is obviously you have the normal retreat but you also have galar mine you got four of those in the deck and one to your point earlier absol so you know like you said about tag teams right if you're up against adp and you have a galar mine out you're one-shotting it if you're up against pikaram uh, you don't even need a Galar Mine because Pikaram has two, three retreat costs. Well, actually, no, you do. Uh, but yeah, you got a Galar Mine, you knock it out. If you have an Absol, um, that'd be doing 240, which is enough to knock it out. Any of the Mewtwo Mew tag teams, I mm -hmm. believe? Mewtwo and Mew is two retreat costs. So I would say it's you would need some of the Inteleons or you'd need the Galar Mine plus the Absol to knock it out. But yeah, to your point, like any anybody that's playing a tag team is not having a good time against this deck. Um, because you know, in terms of its weakness, it's only weak to fire, obviously, because it's grass type. Yeah, and no, and nobody's, nobody's playing, playing fire. fire decks right now. Um, and yeah, like the only other thing that I want to point out, and this is across all of 
day two, as well as anything post-rotation. I just want to call this out right now. Quick shooting, we talk about like, oh, it's a VMAX meta, it's a whatever meta. We are in an Inteleon meta. Let's yeah, just get it we're, straight. We're not in a VMAX meta, we're in no. Inteleon. That's the truth though. Every it sing, is. Every single deck that is doing well, basically, every single deck with the exception of like Eternatus, basically, plays Inteleon because putting two damage counter on one of your opponent's Pokemon every turn is really good at fixing the math. And the you know normally you think, oh, a stage two, that just feels like a little bit clunky. But because this plays the line of Drizzile in the middle where it gets you cards that you need, it's a consistency engine on top of a math fixer. And so yeah, basically- just think of like, just think of like uh, Decidueye GX. That card was yeah. placed in a lot of decks during its time in standard. That card was pretty good, especially when, I mean, that card was really, really good when Force of Giant Plants was around, Sean, and then mm -hmm. Force of Giant Plants got banned. But anyways, I I 100% agree with your statement. We are not in a VMAX era. We are in an Inteleon era. And I just want to say that we are in Inteleon Rapid Strike Quick Shooting specific meta and era because we didn't play the the Inteleon lines before Quick no. Shooting came out and Chilling Rain Sean. Nobody was playing. Drizzle was not a $4 card before, before Quick Shooting Inteleon came out. So all credit to to that to chameleon right you, there do you want to know opinion. what's wild jake because these these drizzles by the way for anybody who played all the way back in base set short sword and shield and like maybe the second set after that um you would get you know in the pre-release kits a bunch of these drizzles a bunch that was your consistency engine in in several of those like bundles so i remember i probably had 30 of these drizzles jake yeah, so many. and my apologies, they're not $4, they're $6. I And I just sold all my bulk, and now all I have is four of these Drizzles now. See, that's why I'm, that's why I'm put afraid of selling my bulk, because there's some whack card like this <laughs> that all of a sudden becomes super good, and then I've lost out on like $150. It's it's wild. It's an uncommon. It's not even a rare. And it's like we, it's, we have that from time to time. There have been even in our tenure since like Unbroken Bonds, there have been some uncommon cards from time to time that have just shot up, a.k.a. Custom Catcher. Yeah. You remember that when that was like a ten dollar yeah. plus trainer card, Sean? Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, that, but like that for a, I've never seen it for a Pokemon. That's an uncommon rare. I mean, it happens. Absol for a time was very expensive. I think Absol yeah, went Absol up to ten was or fifteen. Also, like a ten dollar plus card. Volcanian, uh, fire welder, Volcanian for a time because you know super popular decks were all fire about two years ago. That went oh, up yeah. to like ten dollars. Giratina from uh, Lost Thunder was very expensive for a minute, but an uncommon middle evolution like this being six dollars. Especially it one that's very, it's, it's very uncommon. Ha yeah. ha, pun intended. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah. So I would say to anybody out there, you know, if you're playing the game consistently, you probably know this, but when we get into Zach's event, the late night series and some post rotation talk, you will see that literally every deck that is an Eternatus plays this in Tele Online. So whatever you do, don't be like me. Don't sell this as part of your bulk. Even if you have so many of them, you think, how can this be worth anything? Don't do that. It's... Keep them. Because you, if you want to make more than one deck, you do not want to spend $20 on four copies of this. It's pretty wild, in my opinion. But like these, these Inteleons are so good, and they work so well with a lot of different Pokemon. I think they make... I think they make a lot more VMAXs more viable, especially the ones that we have in the past said don't hit very hard, Sean, mm -hmm. and now they've come into a situation where they can guarantee pretty much two shots onto VMAXs, mm -hmm. opposing VMAXs, because of like the quick shooting Inteleons. I, I know uh, Vinny Fernandez um, mm -hmm. yesterday in the, in the post-rotation event was playing Togekiss Inteleon. We'll get more into that later in those decks later but like togekiss that's not really a deck that we're thinking about in standard sean and now all of a sudden you know people are playing it and it's doing pretty decently all right 
I would yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, it know, has a good to, starting to pop their heads. It has a good matchup um, against you know the this new newcomer deck Leafeon, right? In that it has a no retreat, so the most you can do with your first attack is 120 in post rotation. So, which we'll talk about in a bit. But do you want to talk about uh, the deck that won as well? Um, it was deck not won. This was a hail mary that I pitched at the very end of this podcast. So I will. Well, okay, I I pitched one of the two main attackers in this deck at the end of last week's podcast. So I'll, I'll take 50% credit on this, <laughs> on this answer. Uh, Professor Sean, mm -hmm. this is sweet coon ice rider in Teleon. So with, uh, the, uh, the thing the ice rider V max, Sean weak to that metal and a lot of Luke metal Z out there and a lot of different Zashi index out there. You got to provide flexibility and you got to provide other cards. So what better attacker than that? than Suicune, Sean, this deck yeah. doing very well. This was Sochi Sato. Hopefully I said that correctly, uh, that this is their list and Suicune doing pretty well, doing more damage with the, uh, with, with Pokemon on your opposing players bench and the ability when it's in the active to draw a card, which Everybody likes drawing cards, Sean. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think this one, it's interesting. I feel like the player who played this probably benefited from a, a lower count of Luke medals in day two. Because, right, like we talked about, like, day one, pod one especially, heavy Luke medal did very well. But coming out of that, you saw, you know, a few players do well with Leafeon, and everyone hopped onto that Leafeon train. Um, and I think everyone, meaning especially a lot of people playing Luke Metal, hopped on to the Leafeon train, um, which means less uh, less metal types. Granted, you do have Suicune V here, um, so it's not like you know your main main attacker. There's three and then a two two line here, so it's pretty split. But that said, like you know now you don't have to worry about that with your uh, Ice Riders and. You know, you still got Bench Barrier Mew for Rapid Strike, and you got Reset Stamp and Path to the Peak here to disrupt your opponent late game. It's just, you know, it's... I think another thing that really maybe surprises me here, the Cape of Toughness is interesting. Um, putting that Suicune a little bit out of reach for maybe opposing Zacians, um you know, mirror matches, etc. I don't know if it really puts you that far out of reach in most matchups, because like we said, between a main attack and the Inteleon quick shooting, you're probably able to stretch for it. So, but, you know, obviously it worked out for, uh, for this player. One thing I did see that I saw a player do that ended up working in a match again in, in a quick shooting matchup where the opposing person was using rapid strike, Urshifu VMAX and Inteleon is they actually were putting Cape of Toughness on their Mew. Mm. So we've talked about, especially with Yoga Loop coming in on the Medi Champs with the quick shooting Inteleons putting pings. I've, I've mentioned this myself in the Discord server that I have that I don't know if Mew is like actually a, a, a great tech. You know, it's not like an auto tech like it was against Pikaram way back in the day. You know, when Pikaram was running rampant and stuff. But with the Cape of Toughness, it adds the viability at least a little bit to Mew. It's definitely not the focus. You know, you don't put mm -hmm. Cape of Toughness to put on a Mew. But I think it I think it was a cool interaction and something that I saw that countered like a lot of the meta, you know, with all the Inteleons running around. And I thought it was pretty I thought it was a pretty cheeky move, in I my honest opinion. I will say though, I I have not heard, and maybe people played it, and I'm not seeing it, but like I have not heard a lot of anybody playing Stealthy Hoods in the last tournament. You could play it. I mean, maybe there's probably no, some yeah, good reasons, no, but no, like no, I didn't. it seems like it would have been a good card. All the good decks are playing Inteleon, right? And yeah. you stop Inteleon, you stop Zigzagoon, you stop Absol, right? Like, Absol doesn't add to your retreat if you're a basic. I'm just like, it still amazes me that, like, 
I don't know. I, I think it would have been a one of. I'm surprised it's not a one of in some decks, but I don't know. I, I think tool cards just throughout like the the sun and moon's existence. Yeah. I think tool cards just got jaded like crazy throughout the existence of like late sun and moon, mm -hmm. early sword and shield. Right, because we've always had switch in the format. We have bird keeper in the format. We have air balloon in the format. Yeah, air balloon so. is basically that to me. Like that's the one item that was in a lot of decks. And outside of that, yeah, you don't unless you have a very specific or unique deck. You're not throwing many tools. Yeah, unless you're playing like Luke Metal and having metal goggles, right. or you're. I saw some uh, Leafy on V Max is playing the Leafy on badge okay. that gives your Leafy on V Max free retreat. I thought that was a pretty cool like mirror match counter yeah. that I think could have been uh, actually kind of viable on day two because like you're playing your own Galar Mines, right? You yeah. might need to be able to switch. I saw a lot of people. Um, I saw a couple matches throughout the tournament on day two of like Leafy on decks getting stuck. Their active is stuck because of Galar Mines. So it's an interesting thought and idea. Um, but I think I want to mention, I want to go back to Suicune real quick. I yeah. think another reason why Suicune was so good is because I think this has been the, this has been the meta, the biggest meta since, you know, Sword and Shield base set came out that we have filled our bench. I don't think our bench has ever been more full than what it is right now in the Pokemon trading card game because of quick shooting Inteleon. Mm -hmm. And like all all the Inteleon stuff going on, you know, aside from if you look at the top decks that are going on right here, um, Sean, you see you see ADP Moltres, which has Moltres on the bench, which has Dedene, which has Crobats on the bench. Decidueye your one thing, you know, you could get caught, but those Pokemon are so small mm -hmm. anyways that you're probably not using. Um, you could probably use like. Ice Rider, Cali Rex V, you know, not the V Max, just using like the well, V or something like that. You, you, also you know, have you can a lot of lists. Move around. Might, a lot of lists were also playing like a one of Phoebe. Yeah, yeah, you could get you could get around that. Luke Metal, uh, kind of can fill the bench just depending on what they're trying to do. You know, they're probably going to try to use Zamazenta mm -hmm. in the matchup that you have against them because you play Ice Rider, Cali Rex V Max. So why not Eternatus? So that that's I mean, yeah. no brainer. Um, so the list just goes on and on, and I think that the I think that Suicune just works well. It's not a great, it's not great, but I think it's it does well enough that it, especially if you pair it with the Ice Rider Calyrex V Max, I think it gives you a lot of flexibility. I don't know if it's its own deck, but pairing with with other water types, having that two attack cost, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, before we get into some post rotation, because I feel like, you know, we've talked about the, the main, the main things that were interesting in, in the pog championship. Uh, but there's, there's one subject, Jake, that I think we wanted to, to focus on for a little bit here, which is the thing that blew up Twitter, which is the, uh, DQ of Luke, the disqualification of Luke Morsa, Celio's network, for those of you who don't know. Uh, from day two of the Pog Championship. Jake, do you want to go into a little bit of uh, a quick explanation as to why, and then um, we can get into the discussion? So I'm going to try my best to present everything that we know and all the all the little tidbits, uh, because this is, I was not, I, w I watched it transpire. I was not, like, I'm not Luke. I'm not no. the people at Atlas you know, everything that Sean and I say, just want to clarify, is our stance, is our opinion. Mm -hmm. Massive respect to, you know, people who TO, who judge, all that stuff. But oh, yeah, massive respect our, to both parties. I think that's a key. Yeah, yeah like, respect Luke to everyone judges. out here. We're just trying to lay out the facts and we're just trying to lay out how we feel about it. But anyways, so during Luke Morris, uh, Sealers Network is a content creator. He literally said on his stream, over the weekend, I remember hearing this quote and I thought it, it made me smile. It really made me smile. He said that he considered himself a content creator first, player second, right? A good example is last night he was playing in a tournament 
the Zach Lesage post rotation. He wasn't going to make top cut, but he wanted to play out all his rounds for content purposes. Like that's the kind of guy that Celios is. A lot of times he will talk out while he's playing. He will talk out, you know, his thoughts, his plays, right? Kind of as content creators usually do. His mother, Mama Network, love Mama Network, love her. She's great. Being the mom that she is, right? Wants her son to do well, right? Wants her son to do well. And she plays in the events as well. Yeah. She, I, I would actually state right now that Mama Network is a better player than I am. Uh, hands down. Yeah. Joan, I don't think there's any question about that. Joan is a staple in the community, a treasure. Yes. Uh, I would say. And yeah, plays in a ton of events. does very, very well. So. And they're usually like playing in the same room at yeah. the same time in the same tournament, which is whatever. There was an interaction between Mama Network and Luke where there was discussion on a play right or some sort of game state situation and so somebody reported it to the atlas judges they looked at the vod they said you cannot discuss with another person you know right next to you even if it's your mom you cannot discuss you know advancing your game state you cannot discuss potential plays potential outs things of that nature we're going to have to DQ you. And so Luke was DQ'd, was not able to make top cut. And the Twitter world was very unhappy about the DQ. I think for the most part was because they, in originally, this is not how it is yeah. now. Originally, yeah. they took out Luke's name in the results and they just left it with an asterisk. Mm -hmm. They have since replaced it. But like Luke's not going to get prize money for his placing and stuff. And he he said on stream like he's OK with that. That's fine. He just wanted his name up there. Yeah, because um, I mean, like. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into it, but like that feels that's the one part that did feel a little bit like, OK, no, you don't need an asterisk. <laughs> it makes sense because apparently this is secondhand knowledge that I saw on Twitter. So um, take it for what it is. But I've heard that on Twitter, if you cheat during a Pokemon event, like an IRL Pokemon event in the history, you are kind of that is taken away from the history books. Like they basically yeah. put an asterisk on your name in the history books. Um, so it, it's consistent in that aspect. Yes. But it still leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Jake, what are you? So we've, we've kind of laid out the facts here, and I think Twitter was very divided. Um before we actually get into our thoughts, we actually reached out to Neil Pye, who um, has been on the pod before, actually, recently. Um, yes. Great TO, runs the Sunday Open, was judging this event, and I think was the one that was one of the ones involved in making the call with this. Um, we reached mm -hmm. out to, to, to Neil Pye to get his thoughts on the situation. Jake, do you want to read that? Yeah, the, we we wish we could have gotten him on the podcast, but it was a little it was a little too soon. You know, Sean yeah. had just just literally last night came back from Chicago. So we 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 sadly couldn't get anything before this podcast aired today. But um, I just want to first state that Neil Pye's statements. This is all through Twitter DMs. Mm -hmm. These statements are all Neil Pye. This is not on. Uh, oh on behalf of the tournament this is not on behalf of alice this is on behalf of neil pie all right so i just i just want to point that out there he stated to me that he thought it was the right thing to do in the circumstances i think that's one thing that a lot of people are leaving out is the fact of in the circumstances so prior to this luke was not given any warning about the dq it was the report the investigation the the uh the the what's the word that i'm looking for the disqualification yeah sean it, it came in that order mind you that this is super late in the tournament like this is right before top cut that they're getting this notice and i actually asked neil pie i said um would the situation have changed if the staff was informed of something like this like let's say Let's hypothetically say that the discussion between Mama Network and Celios happened every single round, Sean. It happened every single round. Mm -hmm. If the TOs and the judges and stuff were reported during round one, would a different result 
happen in comparison to the situation that did transpire right before Top Cut. And, quote, for me as a judge, it is extremely possible that it would have been ruled slightly different if it had been discovered earlier. Yes, the reasoning there is because of the impact of the tournament as a whole, unquote. So I think that's one thing that a lot of people need to remember. I mean, I know there's a lot of debate about the specific bylaws on the Pokemon Handbook. I just want to state that I don't know the specific bylaws <laughs> of the Pokemon Handbook. I just know kind of the general consensus of things. But that makes sense in my opinion, Sean. Obviously, there is way more impact in right before Top Cut, right? You're in like round 15, day two, in comparison to round one at the very start of the tournament. Yeah. There's more things on the line yeah yeah i i agree like i thought about that too and i'm like yeah because you're so late into the tournament and you know this happens and it's like hey like the stakes are super high and i think it's fair for them to come back and said okay it's just in just a disqualification you know it's hard to give a warning when there's only like one round before top cut right like it's just an unfortunate reality of that situation of the context as as neil pie said earlier um, so, I mean, I'll give, I'll give my thoughts on this specific ruling, Jake, and then, and then you can give your thoughts as well, unless we're in agreement, we might be, but, well, I mean, I think we're in agreement with what you're going to say, but I think where I take it is a little bit different. Okay. Um, it's, it, it, it evolves the conversation, but anyways, go. Well, I mean, so my thought is I agree with Neil Pye and the judges in this context, and the thing that everyone brought up afterwards, there's a few a few arguments that were made. Uh, I think the first one is like, you know, Twitch chat, right? Like, what about Twitch chat? Twitch chat helps streamers out all the time. And you're kind of saying to people, you shouldn't stream because if somebody wants, they can just report your Twitch chat for saying something. I think these tournaments have been going on now for nearly 18 months in general. I have never heard of a streamer getting DQ'd because of something Twitch chat did, right? So... That is, I think, one area where all judging staff has basically decided we are not going to penalize streamers for what Twitch chat is doing. Now, if a streamer were being very blatant and saying like, okay, chat, vote on what I should do next, you know, like that, I think, but that has never happened, right? That has not happened. That's an extreme situation. Otherwise, I think judges are aware of streamers and do not penalize, even though they probably could have for this entire time with streamers in their Twitch chat. <clears throat> Instead, they decide, you know what? You as a streamer cannot really control what your chat says about getting help or whatever. And yes, you could turn on emote only, but like, you know, that's most, most streamers don't want to do that. And they've decided not to penalize for that. And I do think that's the right decision. But getting a, a human being in the room with you, discussing it, is, you know, that's a different thing. And because that, of that difference, that's, I think, why this ruling is different and not comparable to, like, all the Twitch chat arguments. Um, I want to say, I want to go back to the phrase that Luke had, that I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, where Luke said, I consider myself a content creator first, player second. I think if you don't have that mindset for tournaments, I don't think you should stream your tournaments. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. I don't think you should stream your tournaments because I think, Sean, the biggest thing about this conversation is that it sets a precedent. Mm -hmm. I think it sets a precedent. You go, you mentioned, which I didn't know you were going to mention. You mentioned Twitch chat. Mm -hmm. Who's to say, you know, I can say right up here, you know, I'm closing Twitch chat. I'm not looking at Twitch chat. But Sean, right now on the Metapod on YouTube, how do you know that I'm not looking at Twitch chat? Oh, I mean, there's no way. It, so, but that's... And we talk about emotes. We talk about emotes, right? Yeah. What about what about fail emotes? What about hype emotes? What about, like, think about how different emotes that people can have and that are global emotes as well that, re that bring different feelings, that bring different responses. I'm not saying that it's going to happen tomorrow, but how long until a TO DQ someone because someone in chat 
or some people in chat were either in emote only modes, spamming, yay, nay, emotes, all that stuff, or, you know, providing, providing, um, like, un unprompted help. I, right out of the streamers control because let's be honest sean anybody who streamed on twitch anybody who's watched twitch streams for a long time you can put like mellow magic carp says up there like hey don't help ding dong it's a tournament you know mellow mellow's great for doing yeah. that and and like many streamers do that but everybody knows that's been on twitch for a while knows that twitch chat thinks that they're always right yeah, backseat gaming you know, that that thinks that twitch chat is smarter than everybody else so I don't I don't know. I think that this gives justification now. I think that this gives justification for rule sharking. I think that this gives justification for banning someone because of their streaming and like Twitch chat. I don't I don't think it's going to be something that is adopted by everybody, but I would not be surprised here in the next 2 weeks. Sean, if we hear about someone who got DQ'd because Joe Schmo 39 in Twitch chat was trying to was trying to backseat game. I so I, I'll stick to the statement I said earlier, which is this is how people have been doing this for 18 months. And nobody's for as far as I know has ever been banned for their Twitch chat. But now we have now we have precedent. No, for we it. don't we don't have precedent for Twitch chat. We have precedent for a human being in the room with you discussing things and that precedent has already been set you know at IRL events the idea of like if you had ever heard anybody on like an opposing player or whatever getting coached over discord if that was admitted that would also be a DQ which is that is direct one-to-one -one interaction coaching help whatever you want to call it even if it's not intentional that that's different than twitch chat which is kind of like a, a feature of streaming I've never heard of anybody. So I don't think personally, I don't think that precedent would hold water. And I think if a judge in any tournament were to start ruling that way, what I think would happen is that no one would stream their tournaments, but I don't think other judges would, would rule that way. I think most judges would be like, you know, unless you are explicitly asking or soliciting help from your Twitch chat. And if you had a VOD of that, yeah, ban that. DQ that individual because that individual is like, yo, chat, what should I do here? This is, you know, like, don't do that. But the majority of streamers and, you know, especially the people who stream and play regularly, the, the streamers we all know and love, uh, they don't do that. I don't think it sets a precedent for that. And I, I don't see that happening. I think that is a, it's a slippery slope argument that I don't think will actually ever come to fruition. I agree. It's a, I agree. I agree that my statement is a little bit slippery slope, but I just, I just know like at my experience at the NCAA, <laughs> you know, seeing, seeing bylaws be made. And then all of a sudden I see these loopholes. I see these workarounds that I'm like, how the hell did you ever think of that? So that's, that's just what I think. That's, I, I just think that if you're a content creator, you need to assume the risk that at this point, you can be banned for the most outrageous things at any time, I feel like. The other aspect of this that I wanted to talk about is the uproar of, um, you know, online tournaments should be judged and treated differently from IRL events. Like, it is not correct or fair to apply the same rules. I think Frosted Caribou had a really great um, thread about this. Several people did. Um, and I think that... Their rationale makes a lot of sense, but can you summarize the rationale? Um, the rationale is essentially that, like you know, IRL events and online events are not the same thing. The idea that you know you, you know, the idea of penalizing somebody for coaching is an unrealistic standard because all it does is punish people who stream, uh, because you will see if they get coached or not. And all of these other people who are probably cheating and getting coached in Discord or Skype or whatever, there's no way to ever know it if they're not streamers. So because you, you can't act, uh, adequately um, monitor that the rule should be, not be enforced because it is an unenforceable rule in most circumstances, which like, okay, I, I agree that like, there is a, a problem in the system that, that exists that's hard to enforce. I do, however, 
the the thing that I take away is that like the rules that if you'd ask anybody before the tournament, am I allowed to be coached by on Discord in person, whatever? Am I allowed to be coached? Every player without fail would have told you, well, legal technically, no, you're not allowed to do that. So everyone is aware of the rules, and just because it's hard to enforce them and a lot of people cheat doesn't change what the rules and the fact that everyone knows that that's a rule. So I do think, though, that Boo's point, I think that maybe some TOs should start experimenting with tournaments where coaching is explicitly allowed. You know? I mean, Pokemon Company has done that. Yeah, Team, team Challenge. Challenge. Now, the difference with Team Challenge, people pointed that out too. It is literally called Team Challenge. It's yeah, not called- but what I'm saying is like, yeah. you're allowed to get like yes. that outside help. You're allowed to get that discussion with exactly. other people. And Hearthstone um, and think- Magic, yeah. I want to say real quick, I hate the conversation of the online events don't mean as much as IRL. I hate the fact that people demean others' accomplishments, right? Okay, there might not be as much recognition from the Pokemon company because you want to chill TCG tournament. Okay, there you might not get booster boxes or or as much prize money, but if a competitor wants to hold the chill TCG tournament that they have entered in to a high standard because they want to win and they want to get better, then I think that they should want to hold it that way. Like who gives a rat's ass what I think, you know, if you, if you like this and you hold this to a high regard, why should I try to bring you down? Like stop demeaning online events like yes they're not irl events we all get that but somebody holds this important we have plenty of people sean that listen to this podcast that started playing pokemon the trading card game during the pandemic like when the pandemic started they started playing they probably hold online events to a very high regard right And I don't blame them. I congratulate them. You go for those events. You do well. You get that practice for tournaments in that tournament kind of setting as much as you can. Like, stop demeaning it. I do think, though, I do think, though, that TOs probably should start saying certain things like, you know, I would be interested if a T like if a TO basically said like we are not going with certain rules in the pokemon handbook or a to like chill tomorrow on wednesday maddie was like we fought like literally says in the description we follow the pokemon handbook to a t yeah i think that's i think that is totally okay i think if a to wanted to be like you know what you're allowed to be coached over discord on a discord call with your buddies if you want you know what sure as long as you don't change decks, fine. I like think- as long as you're the one that's playing and it's your account and uh, all that jazz, sure, go for it. That's I actually think that this opens up a, an a, a opportunity to experiment because up until this point, you know, there hasn't been sort of a a confluence of events where people like were like, hey, wait a minute, yeah, we should be not like judging these events exactly the same as an IRL event because it's impossible to know. But like the standard, the default was you follow the Pokemon rules. I do think though that judges, you know, I, I would you know urge Maddie or or Zach or whoever that are running big events regularly to experiment with like maybe once a week or every now and again doing an event that is coaching allowed. And if you explicitly say it too, every player will have the same opportunity to seek it to help to seek help. That's the problem. Like if 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 the rule is one way but you can't enforce it then the imbalance comes from the people who maybe would have liked coaching and could get it, but chose not to because they don't want to cheat. But if you say it's allowed... I think something that would have been cool if this would have happened like a week earlier, Sean, if we were having this conversation a week earlier, if somebody made a tournament called the Tag Team Tournament and you just, you sign up with a buddy Mm -hmm. on Limitless and you both play, I think that would have been a cool like... Hurrah, not only to tag teams, but also to the tournament itself. But I mean, that's cool. I, I just like. Nah, I don't like online events were not made to be streamed. They were never made to be streamed. 
like unless you are the broadcasting team like mm -hmm. running the tournament right it was never meant to be streamed you know it, 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 you run so many risks when you stream right because you're trying to uh, most of us well actually no maybe maybe i take that back maybe only a few of us are running it for more content purposes right because not every i mean how many how many big ptcg streamers are like luke has been killing it yeah. on numbers by the way the last two weeks i don't know if you've been looking at his numbers but he well averages over 100 like the last 10 days which is phenomenal for him he just applied for partner you know you have azul you have tricky jim who doesn't do a lot of online tournaments but is a big online creator and that's not even counting like youtube like frosted caribou yep. or anything like that like i'm just thinking uh, i'm just thinking my hometown on twitch i mean i would say that it wasn't designed to be streamed like ptcgo none of this i do think though that you know it, even if it wasn't designed that way like it works it's good people for, stream it's good for the online yeah. era yeah it's great it's necessary without it you know you wouldn't have any of these events at this size you just wouldn't um so i think there's value in it and i think people should you know keep doing it and and i i would urge judges not to allow rule sharks to get you for for twitch chat that's just my it's main so hard though for it's so hard for like rule sharks so like let's let's bring up the converse like real quick of like um of the 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 coaching thing going mm -hmm. back to that like if my if my brother passes by me he's walking by you know just grabbing a drink or whatever and he's like oh you better attach that water energy you know like would would a judge be in a position at that point now that we even have luke's i know that's kind of a specific example but i think you kind of know what i mean would a judge be in a position to feel like they have to make like a DQ? Like this is round 15 right before top cut. Somebody does that. A VOD comes to a judge's desk of them saying of, of my brother coming by and saying, Hey, you better attach that water to energy. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I need to, I need to attach that. And, and I think more, and I hope that I top deck research. Do, I, does that put it does that put a pressure i don't and does that put it on a position with a rule sharker i think like if someone have, who comes in is like bah, bah, bah. i th well i think if you have a vod that of the situation you could watch it well, in that like moment a clip if you have a clip though then i think what will happen is the same thing that would happen in an actual irl event which is the person who said something would be reprimanded told to step away and told that you can't talk to the player that ha it happens it does it happens in real life um, and you don't get DQ'd as a player. The reason that the DQ happened in Luke's case was that it was an open discussion, right? Yeah. It was, hey, what do you that's like? What do you? I, that's why I did the response of like, well, I hope I yeah. top deck or research and stuff because I, I, I do believe that it has to provide like some sort of response back. Yes, at least. So but I, that's just a thought that like ran through my head real quick. No, I, you know, I would say to any judges out there, um, it, you know. I would I would argue to any player assume they're using the the Pokemon rule book the official rules and everything unless they state otherwise and then to the judges um, I would say if there's you know actual discussion happening and you have that rules you do need to enforce that maybe it's a warning if it's early but it is a DQ if it's later but Twitch chat please do not because I think that is the bridge too far I think if people start DQing over Twitch chat. That, I think, is when it devolves into a situation. But I think what will happen there is those tournaments will not be attended by streamers, will not be showcased, and will not be I mean, how many, how many tournaments have we talked about from, like, you know, that I won't name any other tournaments, but big-name tournaments have some sort of horrible call, awful call, that don't, that don't, that don't, but go down. I just, I just, I, I don't know. Yeah. I just, I worry. I'm a mother, Sean. I worry <laughs> about these things. I, I have unreasonable anxiety about some things. But I mean, you, Sean, you are a streamer, so I get it. I get. We have that perspective. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think about a lot of things from a content creating aspect. But, yeah. but shout out to shout out to everybody who who creates content and does well in tournaments. Like, man, that is one thing. When I was playing the trading card game every day on on Twitch. <laughs> 
like if I could just do well in a tournament and then like be able to make a video about it, <laughs> that great. was awesome. That would be great. Uh, Jake, uh, we're kind of running long in the tooth here, but do we want we'll to talk briefly? We'll try to do, po let's do post station stuff next week, okay. Sean. I, I want to point out one deck. actually happened. I want to point out one deck, though, because I think this is very interesting. Yes, I have a deck that I want to point out, too. Okay, Dragapult. It seems like Dragapult is making a comeback because, again, we're living in a quick shooting Inteleon era. <laughs> so mm -hmm. just preface that. But the the reason being is um, uh, I, I noticed in this tournament Rapid Strike Urshifu did not do well because you have lost any weakness protection. And now Dragapult is like, I will eat. Thank you. I will eat your lunch. Um, I, will, I will. Thank you for your lunch money. Yes. And it has a benefit of only having one retreat cost, which is particularly good against Leafeon as well. And so Leafeon can max get it to three retreat costs. I like Dragapult in this format. I mean, you have Raihan with a little bit of energy acceleration when things go sour, right? Mm -hmm. And we go back to the quick shooting. I mean, Inteleon has made d decks like a wide variety of more decks viable. We'll see with the test of time because this yeah. is still like a premature format. We'll see with the test of time if this is still okay if this is still good, but I think that Dragapult is in a better position than it was, you know, three months ago. But Jake, what a was yours? I, a deck that I want to bring up that you're not really going to see on this, on this list right here, because it didn't finish super, super well is rapid strike Malamar. I saw a couple people we see, I think it was 20th was the highest placing in this tournament. Rapid strike Malamar. This is a cheap deck. Sean, mm -hmm. you want to play a deck post rotation. You want to play something that's relatively cheap. Rapid Strike Malamar is a very, very cheap option. It's a fun option, in my opinion. It's the deck that I've been playing on ladder, trying to prepare and shake off a lot of the rust that I have right now. And one thing that I've also been seeing is a lot of these smaller decks as well. A lot of people are playing Bruno. Hmm. A lot of people are starting to play Bruno. Bruno is a shuffle draw. If a Pokemon gets knocked out a previous turn, you draw seven cards. If not, you draw four. Shuffle draw seven is pretty good, um, especially if you're like a one prizer deck like a Malamar where you're getting knocked out every single turn, or maybe you've got a more squishy set of Pokemon. So I don't know. Like if you want to play, if you want to play a budget deck, I think Rapid Strike Malamar is a good budget deck option for you as you prepare for post rotation in my opinion i i love that and I, i'll be excited to see how single strike that's uh, that's not single prize pokemon bounce back now that adp is rotating that exciting times it's ahead i know weird so so we'll talk about this more next week but like i think that it's a weird spot for single prize pokemon because Rapid Strike Urshifu pretty much takes the spot of ADP, in my opinion. I Yeah, I agree. That's why I'm saying, like, if if Rapid Strike Urshifu actually suffers more than people expected post-rotation because of weakness and because there's a few really good psychic decks out there, that, that'll be, like, it's it's got to get pushed out. But I think Rapid Strike Urshifu can get pushed out of um, a metagame more easily than ADP could have. So we'll see. I'll be interested to see. Yeah, we'll talk more about that next week and after we evaluate the first weekend of post rotation. But Sean and I are heading out. We gotta get it. We gotta get this pod on air. It's Tuesday morning. It I mean, this pod comes out in a in. Well, I mean, Sean's gonna get it out in like thirty minutes. I gotta stream right. here in like forty five. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but anyways, Sean, you have a great rest of the day. Have a good. Any Digimon stuff going on? Uh, not. I mean, no. No, I, I'm going to Gen Con. That that's week. it. That's it. <laughs> well, I, I hope you have a great rest of the week, Sean. Thank you all for watching and listening to the Metapod. Remember, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube. You go to the Atrocious Gameplay YouTube channel. All the links down below. Thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, my favorite content creator on Pokemon, uh, Asterisk Network. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>